session coming up. And uh, so we're going to just take a moment, if you would allow me. I would like to take a moment to pray for our nation. Because I think that this nation is at a crossroads and we need to be interceding in behalf of our nation. Anybody agree with me? So would you just join me in prayer? Let's just take a moment and intercede for our nation in this critical time. Let's pray. Father, we do want to just pause and recognize that you stand sovereign over the nations. And so, God, I just intercede now as we come before you in the presence of the living God. We are interceding for this nation that seems to be drifting so far from you. There is such a need for revival. And we see all that's happening in this country. And, and, and Lord, it's very concerning to us. So we just pray and intercede that, especially in this election coming up and all the chaos that's possible around it, God, that, that you would certainly guide those who are believers in Jesus Christ to vote by praying and asking you to lead them, Lord, as they vote, and that you would direct believers in Jesus Christ uh, and God, that you'd watch over this nation, for it is surely broken. And uh, we are very deeply concerned as we intercede tonight. We come to you and ask that you would move in power on this nation. We need revival in this land. We need revival in this nation. So God, I just pray that this nation would wake up and recognize their great need for you and how far they've wandered away. Bring this nation to a place of drawing nearer, Lord, for it's so clear that this nation has wandered far from you. We ask that now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen and amen. Keep praying, keep praying. This is a very concerning time in which we are living. All right, church, let's do a Bible study. Would you please open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 26. And uh, as most of you know, we're going through the whole Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and uh, God sent forth his word, and he sent it in power, and he uses it in our lives, all of it. And so when you read through the Old Testament, there's so much for us, and it points to Jesus throughout it. And so we just certainly want to receive from God's word. So we're picking it up right here in Deuteronomy 26. Moses is giving really his last speech to Israel before they cross the Jordan and enter into that land that God promised them. He's not entering in. He said he will die here in this mountain. But he is giving them an epic speech. As you're going to see, it's a call for revival. And uh, we're picking it up near the end. We're in chapter 26. It's near the end. Uh, and so let's pick it up right here. Chapter 26, verse 1. Then it shall be. Moses is speaking to all the people. And then it shall be that when you enter that land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, and you possess it and live in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground. When you get in and you begin to harvest the very first of the produce, you shall bring that in from your land that the Lord your God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket, and go to that place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. We know, of course, that will be Jerusalem. They don't know yet. We know it's Jerusalem. You shall go to the priest there, the priest who is in the office at that time, and you shall say to him this. Okay, here's your speech. This is, a, this is the speech that you're supposed to make if, if you were living in Israel at this time. You enter into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to have the very first produce of the land. And then you take that in the basket to the priest, and then you make a speech. And this is the speech that you make. Now listen, because that's a good speech. And uh, there's, there's some principles in it. So this is the speech. And you shall set it down, and you shall say this. Verse 5. You shall answer and say before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt, and he sojourned there, few in number, but there he became a great and mighty and populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. 
Then we cried to the Lord, to Yahweh, the God of our fathers. And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand in an outstretched arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. And he brought us to this place. And he has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first of the produce of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given to me. And then you shall set it down before the Lord your God, and you shall worship before the Lord your God. This is a way of just saying, God, you are the one who's blessed my life. You have blessed me. I, I just want to recognize that you're the hand. You took me out of the miry clay. You took me out of Egypt, out of the oppression of slavery, and you brought me to this place of abundance, and it's flowing with milk and honey, and your blessing is on this land. Oh, God, thank you so much. And then you worship right there in that place. Now, see, this is a great perspective, isn't it? Because, you know, Israel being taken out of Egypt is a picture of our salvation, our salvation, being taken out of the world, taken out of the mess. Aren't you thankful that God took you out of the mess that your life was in and he set your life on a rock and now you can live in the abundance of the blessing of God on your life? Be thankful for that. You know, we're coming up on Thanksgiving and it's a theme of the scriptures. You should be thankful as a continual aspect of your heart. Those who are thankful are really demonstrating humility. Make sure that you don't come and say, well, I did this. I'm the, I'm the one. I'm the clever one. I am so good. I am. I just got the golden finger. I don't know. I just, whatever I do, it just seems like I'm so, I am good. I am good. And he says, don't you don't know. Uh, uh, uh. God is the blesser of your life. Anything you have, God gave that to you. And you be thankful that God has blessed you. Like he's blessed you. Amen. Starting with the fact that he saved you. That he brought you out of the mess that your life was in. And he set your life. All right. Then he continues. Verse 12. Uh, verse 11. And you and the Levite. Thank you. And the alien who is among you. Shall rejoice in all the good. That the Lord your God has given you in your household. Then when you have finished paying all the tithe of the increase in the third year, because there wasn't much to harvest in the first and second, when you plant a, uh, an orchard or whatever, it doesn't produce, you know, right away. So the year of tithing, then you shall give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan, and to the widow, that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. So bless the orphan, bless the widow. Bless, and you shall say to the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion from my house. What does that mean? What is the sacred portion? Well, the sacred portion is the tithe, the first part. That's yours, God. I give you the first. Now, the reason that the first was God's portion, because the very first of the produce of the land or whatever was the best. God, it's the best. You get this sacred portion before uh, I get anything. It's yours, God. I want to just say thank you so I do that. I have removed that sacred portion from my house, and I have given it to the Levite and the alien and the orphan and the widow according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. And I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. Harry, I see you standing back there. Would you mind checking the thermostat? It seems kind of warm. That would be great. Verse 14, I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor offered any of it to the dead. What? What is that about? What do you mean offer? What, what do you mean you offer? No way. I'm not offering any of it to the dead because that's what some in their... Uh, false religions were doing, offering some kind of uh, tithe or some kind of gifting, you know, to the dead, believing that somehow the dead were going to bless them. Well, I can just tell you right now, the dead are not going to bless you. It's the living God who's going to bless you. 
And what he's saying is, don't, don't, you know, like have a divided heart. Don't say, well, you know, I, I love God, yes, but I love, I love the gods of the world, and I really want both in my life. And he says, no, 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 it does no. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all of your strength. That's the first and foremost, the highest of all that God has ever said. And he knew why he said it. Because he knew that if you didn't love God with all of your heart, that your heart would be divided. And a person with a divided heart is going to find themselves very much confused and in trouble. I did not do any of these things. That's part of your speech. I listened to the voice of the Lord my God. I'll tell you what. You listen to the voice of the Lord your God. You will be blessed. And I'll tell you, this is important. Because there's a, there's a crisis of hearing today, you might say. There are so many people who do not give uh, an ear to the Lord. They don't recognize the voice of the Lord as an authority in their lives. If God is an authority, then he speaks a word to you. And then your answer to him is, yes, Lord. Your word is good. Your principles are right. I know that your heart is to bless me. God, I want to do what you are saying that I must do because I know that your heart is good for me. And so that's why he says it that way. And then he says, verse 15, so therefore, the speech continues, look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people, Israel, and the ground, bless the ground which you have given to us, a land flowing with milk and honey as you swore to our fathers. This day, the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes. Okay, that was the end of the speech. Moses picks it up. This day, the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes in ordinances. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Right there it is. Notice verse 17. You have declared today. Now, I want you to listen. Underline verse 17 because it's a really great verse. You have declared today the Lord to be your God. You have declared today that the Lord God of Israel is your God. You made that declaration. And so you declared that you would walk in his ways, keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances, and that you would listen to his voice. You have made a declaration today. Now here's why this, this is so important. It's like that challenge that Joshua brought to Israel when he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here's my point. I, I am convinced we got to come to the place where we have this thing settled. God, I declare, I have made my mind. I know in whom I have believed. You're my God. This thing is settled. I stand on this rock. I'm not confused. I'm not divided. I know in whom I have believed. That's what Paul says. I know in whom I have believed. I'm not confused. I'm not divided. I know in whom I have believed. You have made a declaration today that God is your God. Anybody would agree with me? If you, would, if you make that same declaration today, would you just raise your hand to the Lord? I just, yes, I have made this declaration. I am yours, you are mine. This thing is settled with me. Now, this is important because if that is the case, then what follows is, therefore, I will walk in your ways and I will listen to your voice. This thing is settled with me. I will walk in your ways. I will listen to your voice. This thing is settled with me. Because I tell you, many people, they, have, they're, they're, they are divided of heart. They are confused. And so this is important to settle this. Notice, however, verse 18. And the Lord's made a declaration about you, by the way. Verse 18 says, and the Lord has declared today you to be his people. Now, this is beautiful. You've made a declaration that the Lord is your God. He has made a declaration 
that you are his people. You are a treasured possession. Now, let those words just capture your heart. Do you know what God says to you? You are a treasured possession. Child, you are mine, and I love you. I love you. This is God of heaven saying to you, I love you. You are a treasured possession. Now, someone's going to hear that and say, well, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve to be loved. I'm not worthy of that love. I'm a sinner. I've messed up my life. Listen, he's not saying that he loves you because you earned that love. He's not saying that he loves you because somehow he was so impressed with your amazing way of living that he couldn't help himself. He didn't look at you and say, you are so cute. You know, it's not like, you know, how, how you, you, little kids. Little kids are so cute. They're just adorable. I, 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 I just love kids. I think God loves kids. But I don't think that God looks at us like that kid and says, you are so cute. I just can't help myself. I think what God says, you are messed up. And I love you. I have put my image. I made you in my image. And I don't care what you've done. My love for you knows no bounds. And I have sent my son to pay the price for every sin that you've ever done. So that you, forgiven and justified, can draw near to the living God. And have a relationship to the one who says, you are mine, child. I didn't love you because you're so perfect. I love you because you're made in my image and I sent my son to pay the price to redeem you from the mess that you were. God is the friend of sinners. Jesus was sent by the father to seek and to save sinners like you and me. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. I tell you that is amazing. And we should thank God for that kind of love. You are mine, child. You are a treasured possession. Amen. Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. Notice what it says, verse 18. The Lord declares today, you are his people, a treasured possession as he promised, and that you should keep all his commandments, and that he set you high Above the nations which he has made. He's speaking now to a nation. The nation of Israel. He sets you high for praise, for fame, for honor. That you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God. As he has spoken. That is God's heart for Israel. That they would be set apart amongst the nations. Chapter 27. Then Moses and the elders of Israel charged the people and said. Now keep all the commandments which I command you today. So it shall be on the day when you cross that Jordan to that land which the Lord your God gives you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones. And I want you to coat them with lime. This will make them white. Then I want you to write on these large stones all the words of this law. So that when you cross over, in order that you may enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord God of your fathers promised, so it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up there on Mount Ebal these stones, as I'm commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Then, moreover, you shall build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones, You shall not wield an iron tool on these stones. They shall not be touched with the hands of men's tools. This is an altar made the way God made those stones. You will build an altar, verse 6, of the Lord your God of uncut stones and offer on it burnt offerings to the Lord your God. Remember the offerings as we went through them in Leviticus, that the burnt offerings was a declaration 
of being wholly devoted to the Lord. The burnt offering was wholly consumed and it represented your heart of being wholly devoted to the Lord. I am yours, Lord. I am wholly devoted to you. And that's the heart behind that, that offering. Verse 7, then offer peace offerings. Peace offerings, which is to say, God, there's a relationship here between you and me. And I have much peace. There is peace in my soul because of the relationship that you have with me, that you have allowed me to have with you. And there is peace in my heart. I give you this offering as a picture of this peace. And I'll tell you, there is something very deep. When you have such a relationship to the Lord, there is a deep peace. There is a residing peace that is very deep in the soul. There's, there is so much today of fear and insecurity and anxiety. But when you come into the presence of the Lord and know his heart for you, there is a peace that begins to settle on your soul, a deep residing peace that resides on your soul. It's you and God, and that's good. It's you and God, no one else, just you and God, and it's good. There's a deep residing peace. God wants you to have this deep residing peace. You don't need the approval of men. You need the peace that comes between you and God. That's a beautiful place to be in your life. Peace. Bring an offering to speak of it. And then he says, and then I want you to eat of this peace offering. If you remember the peace offering, including an aspect of eating with it. It's a, it's a way of saying, let's have a meal together, Lord. Remember that when Jesus said, I, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and he who hears my voice will, opens the door. I will come in, the door of his heart. I will enter in. And I will sup with him. We're going to have a meal together. You know, communion in many ways is a picture of that very thing. We're having a meal with the Lord. God is saying we're going to have fellowship. You know, when you, when you have a relationship, it's common to sit down and have a meal. That's one of the beautiful parts of a relationship. Sitting down and having a meal together. Having a nice conversation. And so you eat of that peace offering. And then notice verse 7, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. He's saying to you, I want you to have a rejoicing in your relationship to the Lord. Now, this is a beautiful aspect, isn't it, of our relationship to God? Now, I know there's burdens. I know there's stresses. I know there's all kinds of things in the uh, world and pressures and schedules and all kinds of stuff. I know all of that. But he says, don't you see that one of the most beautiful parts of just being at peace in your walk with God is a deep residing joy also. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. In another place, he says, my, my joy I give to you. There is a deep residing joy. I want you to be rejoicing. So many people, I don't know. They, they, I, I, how is it that some people think that their Christian walk is supposed to be that of sour grapes, that they're supposed to walk around with burdens all the time. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest for your soul. He said, let there be rejoicing. It's good. It's good. When there's rejoicing in your heart, there's something really beautiful. It's good. Rejoice in the Lord. Let peace be in the Lord. And then he says, And you shall write on these stones, verse 8, all the words of this law. And I want you to write them very distinctly. I love that part. The reason why they're uh, in white, so that the words will stand out. And I want you to be able to read them. I want the people to read them distinctly. I just think there's something right about that. You know, when... when the, when Nehemiah, this is many late, uh, years later in their history, when they come back, 
from their exile in Babylon. They find the word of God. And they were so touched because they had not read it in so many years. They gathered all the people together and they read the word, it says, and they read it distinctly so as to help them understand the meaning. Notice what it says then. Verse 9, then Moses and the Levitical priests spoke to Israel saying, be quiet, be silent and listen, O Israel. This day you have become a people for the Lord your God. Listen up now, Israel, today you have become his people. You shall therefore obey the Lord your God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. So Moses also charged the people on that day. When you cross the Jordan, these shall, shall stand on Mount Gerizim. So they go to this valley. On one side is Mount Ebal. On the other side is Mount Gerizim. So he says on Mount Gerizim now to bless the people, I want you to put representatives from Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now for Mount Ebal, the curses that I want to be spoken. These shall stand on Mount Ebal, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. The Levites shall then answer and say to all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes an idol or a molten image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And then all the people shall answer and say, Amen. All the people, after that, you know, there's more to come. After each of these declarations, all the people are supposed to shout out. Can you just imagine now this vast people there in the valley, and such a declaration is made, and they all shout out together, Amen! The word amen means, may it be. Yes, Lord, may it be. That's what it means. Amen, shout it out, amen. So what does he say? Cursed be the man who makes an idol or a molten image or an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. Well, it's in secret. I mean, why? What harm can be done? It's in secret. Nobody knows. Except God knows. There's no such thing as a secret with God. There's no such thing as a secret with God. All things are laid bare before his eyes, the scripture says. Although it's interesting because some people convince themselves that they can do things in secret. But there's no such thing as a secret. And so this is just a very good word. Okay, listen, there's a very good word here. Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molten image or an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people answer and say, Amen. Let it be, Lord. Let it be. Amen. Because a person who sets up a, an image to uh, uh, the gods of this world in secret has a divided heart. And God says, I want you to love the Lord with all of your heart. Here's my point. Settle this matter. Settle this matter. If God is your God, what does that mean? See, does it not mean that you love him and that you want to honor him in your life? I want to honor you, Lord. You have been amazing. What you have done for me is amazing. You are worthy of honor. You are worthy of praise, and I honor you. I don't want to do things in secret that are dishonoring to you, that you find offensive. I love you, Lord. You know, God is calling us. God is calling us to live before him with our hearts true and filled with honor. It's good. Isn't it that good? It's good. It's good to live with honor. It's good to have your heart filled with the presence of the living God and something good and glorious and honorable is happening in your soul. It's good. It's joyful. It's wondrous. It's peaceful. It's joyful. These are all good things. 
God wants to bless your life. Does he not? He wants to bless your life. And he knows that if you keep things in secret, if you hide secret things, they will become cancerous to the soul. And you will become conflicted. You'll become conflicted inside your soul and you're living in a miserable place. You're what I call the miserable middle. God doesn't want you in the miserable middle. He wants you alive. He wants you filled with joy. He wants you filled with honor. Don't do things in secret, he says, because that will make you conflicted and that will be poison. That'll be cancer. Cancer is not good. Cancer will eat you alive, he says. No, don't do this. Don't do this. And then everybody says, that's right. That's right. That's a good word. That's right. That's a good word. Amen. That's right. That's a good word. Is that a good word, church? It's a good word. Amen. So then he says, cursed is the one who dishonors his father and his mother. And the people shall say, amen. You know, you honor your father and your mother. You're showing integrity and character of heart. I don't know what kind of mother and father you had. But I can tell you that you can honor your father and your mother, even if you disagree with them. My father was an alcoholic. And he was abusive and difficult. He was an angry old cuss. Now, I can say those things because he said those things. And then later in his life, he came to faith in Jesus Christ. So I want to make sure you know the end of the story. He came to faith in Jesus Christ in our church. I got to baptize him with my own hands and he reconciled with my mother. They never married, but they became friends. So I grew up with a father who was an alcoholic, cuss, cantankerous, and mean. But I'll tell you what, I would never dishonor my father. He's not mine to settle. That's between you and God. He's not mine to settle. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've asked me to honor, and that's what I'll do. And it came back. It came back. It came back because the door was open. The road was paved. And when he needed help, the road was there. And the door was open. I will help you. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ. Because besides that, God wants you to be free. God doesn't want you to live your life carrying uh, anger and hurt and bitterness and, 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 and sorrows all your life. Be free. Be free. Be free of that. Let God have that. Give God that. Come unto me. Uh, lay them down. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Lay them down. Let go. It's for you. It's for you. You're good. As for you, he said, well, he's not worthy. He's not, he doesn't deserve it. That's between him and God. God says, you honor your father. You honor your mother. It's character. And that's what God wants you to have is character. Amen. Because it honors God. It honors God. Cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary mark. Well, I just moved a few stones. <laughs> Who knew? God knew. God knew. Do the right thing. Do the right thing, even when no one is watching. That's character. That's that's the way to live. There's honor in that. That's the way to live. Do the right thing, even when no one is watching. That's the way to live. And all the people said, amen. That's right. Cursed is the one who misleads a blind person on the road. And all the people say, amen. A a blind person on the road. My friend, can you help me? I don't know. I can't see. How much money do I have? How much money do you have? Uh, Let me see. Not much. Really, you have just a little. God sees. God sees. Honor. Character. Character. And integrity. 
That's the way to live. And he's, all the people say, amen, amen. Because your heart's at peace. You got peace in your heart. I tell you what, God doesn't want you to have money if you got to get it that way. Amen. God doesn't want you to have money if you got to get it that way. If he's going to bless you, let him bless you. Let him bless you. If he's going to bless you, let him bless you. Amen. Verse 19. I was, make, I was going to make more progress than this. I am really not going fast. Cursed is he who distorts justice. That's due to an alien. Well, he's just a traveler. He, he, I will never even see him again. Nope. You do not distort justice to the alien or the orphan or the widow. And all the people say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his mother's wife. And the people say, What? That should not ought to eat. That should not ever even enter the heart of a person. That's right, because he's uncovered his father's skirt, and all the people say, Amen. These are some of the practices of the nations from which they were going. These are some of the practices that are part of the world. Here's the thing. The world, I'll tell you what, there's all kinds of practices in the world right now that God finds offensive. Does anybody agree with me on this? There's all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of practices that are in the world that God finds offensive. Have nothing to do with that. He says, I'm speaking to you. God will, that's between them and God. God will settle that between them and God. That's between them and God. But as for you, have nothing to do with those things. Because God finds them offensive. And God is your God. Honor your God. So then he says, uh, verse 21, Cursed is he who lies with an animal. And all the people say, that's right. What? What? But, it, but that was a thing. That was a thing of the nations. Cursed is he who lies with his sister the daughter of his father, of his mother. And all the people say, amen. What is he saying? He said, Look, let there be honor even in your sexuality. Even in your sexuality. Humans are sexual people. But know this, God gave that as a gift. Therefore, it is something that you must honor God with. Honor God with that aspect of your life. And all the people said, Amen. Verse 23, Cursed is he who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people say, Amen. Cursed is he who strikes his neighbor in secret. And all the people say, Amen. Cursed is he who accepts a bribe to strike down an innocent person. Bribery is not honorable. And it distorts justice. And all the people should say, Amen. Verse 26, Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people say, Amen. Chapter 28. Oh yeah, we're doing this. Chapter 28. Now it shall be, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And we know that he did. When they honored God, we know that he did. Above all these blessings, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you will obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be, or blessed shall be the offspring of your body. In other words, your children will be blessed. And the produce of your ground will be blessed. And the offspring of your beast will be blessed. The increase of your herd will be blessed. And the young of your flock will be blessed. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. And blessed shall you be when you go out. 
because God will do it. God will see to it. Do you believe that this is a principle of the Lord? This is a principle of the Lord. Uh, Galatians 6, it's also a New Testament principle. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That's a great opening to a verse, isn't it? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That which a man sows, he shall also reap. The one who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to his spirit, to the spirit, excuse me, will from the spirit reap life, even eternal life. Therefore, do not grow weary in doing good. For you will reap in time. Do not grow weary in doing good. Blessed shall you be when you come in. And blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise up. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. Got to read it the right way. They shall come out against you one way, but they're going to flee in seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to do. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people unto himself, as he swore to you. If you will keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, so all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will be afraid of you because they know that the hand of God is on your life. They don't want to mess with a person whose God is powerful and reigns over all the nations. And is the blesser of your life. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity. In the offspring of your body. And in the offspring of your beast. And in the produce of your ground. In the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse. The heavens to give rain to your land in its season. And to bless all the work of your hand. And you will lend to many nations. But you will not borrow. That's a, that's a declaration of a nation that's strong. A nation that is a lending nation is far stronger than a nation that's a borrowing nation. Anybody agree with this? There's a lot I want to say right now. And the Lord, verse 13, shall make you the head and not the tail. And you only shall be above and you shall not be underneath. If you will listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. Do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today. Do not turn to the right. Do not turn to the left. Do not go after other gods. Do not serve them. I want to bless you. That blessing is based upon several key things. It's based upon that declaration that you made. You are my God. It's based on that. You are my God. I thank you for all that you've done in my life. You saved me. You took me out of the miry clay. You took me out of the mess that my life was in. You took me out of Egypt. You've blessed me. You've taken me unto yourself. You've adopted me as a son or as a daughter. You are amazing. I make a declaration. You are my God. And that is the beginning of tremendous outpouring on your life. But there's more. Because he then says, but I give you the principles of my word. I give you the wisdom. I give you the ways, the statutes. I give you the, 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 the character of integrity and honor. I want you to walk by these things. You walk by these things and it will produce in you tremendous blessings on your life. And it's not just the things, the, the blessing of things. I tell you, the blessing of things are small in comparison to the blessings of who you are. Who you become in God is tremendous 
blessing itself. Who God makes you to be is a greater blessing than anything you may have. People can have things and lack character and they have nothing. But you have that which God gives you in the soul. That's the greatest blessing of all. Because you've got peace. There's a joy that's deeply abiding. There's a rejoicing in the Lord. There's a heart, there's a soul that's filled and overflowing. These are the blessings that God has for you. Walk in them. Do not be conflicted. Do not be divided. Settle this matter. You're my God. And this matter is settled in heaven. And this matter is settled in me. I know in whom I have believed. And I choose to follow you. Anybody else? Father, thank you so much for showing us your heart, your ways, your desire, the way you pursue us, the way you show us character and honor and heart. God, I pray that your spirit would just fall on this church and that there would be a deep residing peace. Because this matter is settled. Church today, let this be wholly settled. Don't be conflicted. Don't be divided. Don't be miserable in the conflict. Settle this. Wholly settle this. Make a declaration. You are my God, and I choose to walk in your ways. I choose the path that you set before me, the path of honor and life and joy and peace and character and honor in the soul because I want you, I want you filling my soul with the presence of the living God. Church, would you settle this today? Holy settled. Make a declaration. This is how I want to live. This is how I want to live. I want to honor you. This is how I want to live my life. I want to honor you. Church, I'm going to ask that you be bold. If you want to make that declaration today, I'm going to ask that you stand on your feet. Just stand on your feet to say to the Lord today, I want to honor you in my life. Right now, if you would just stand on your feet, if you want to make that declaration to the Lord, just stand on your feet and just raise your hand to the Lord. Just like this. Just stand to the, on your feet and just say to the Lord, I want to make a declaration. This thing is settled with me. I want to honor you. Father, thank you. Thank you for moving in your spirit. God, we settle this matter now. We want to honor you. We give you thanks. We give you honor. We give you praise for all that you're doing in our lives and in this church. Pour your spirit out. Revive your people. Revive your people. Pour your spirit out on your church. Draw us to yourself. Ignite our souls. Fill us with your presence in the living God. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor?